Well, it's, uh, it's great to be back. It's been about, um, well, it was 2019, you do the maths, what's that, four years ago or something like that, the last time we were here uh, with our international director, John Mackay. And that was actually the last time that John was in the UK as well. Um, so it's, uh, COVID has sort of put a halt to a lot of the ministry for a few years, but we're back up and running and it's uh, a real delight to be back. Uh, for those of you who um, haven't seen me before, or perhaps the uh, concept of creation research is new to you, um, I'll just give you a little bit of a uh, rundown. Are the slides up and working? Not quite. There we go. There we go. So there we are. You can see creation research, um, our, our main logo and our main website, creation research. Oh, we're going to get there. We are creationresearch.net. And uh, to give you a little bit of a, a quick rundown as to the kind of ministry and uh, the work that I do, this is where you'll find me uh, most of my days nowadays, um, because I am currently halfway through completing a doctorate in paleobiochemistry. And if you want to find out a little bit more about what that is, you can come back this evening uh, because we'll give you a, a little sneak peek into some of the research we're doing. But in a nutshell, we're going into dinosaur bones and we're looking for soft squidgy things. Things like collagen, things like blood cells, things that really shouldn't be there if these bones really are 65 plus million years old. Um, so we uh, get to not just do the research, but also travel around all over the country. Uh, since I was last here, yes, I have uh, been married, and it was sort of strange to hear the term new wife because we've been married now for three years, so it's, <laughs> it is new to, new to you, I suppose. Um, but Sarah Ann does accompany me around uh, a lot of different places, helping me with the research, but also uh, assisting me when we're traveling around and speaking. The UK website is there as well, creationresearchuk.com. And uh, one of the good things that COVID brought about was when we sort of, you know, I was stranded in the USA, finally managed to get back into England, rang up John Mackay in Australia and said, well, what are we going to do now? Um, everything's been cancelled. One of the things that came out of that, which is still remain to this day, is a podcast called Creation Conversations. It goes out every single week on a Friday uh, on YouTube and Facebook, and it also goes out um, on uh, all the podcast servers as well. But really, it's a chance to every single week deal with a different topic. And it doesn't just deal with the creation things. It doesn't just talk about evolution. It talks about lots of things like, um, what is a woman? I mean, that was a, uh, a topic just uh, a few weeks back. It's a, it's a very controversial topic in these day and ages, but we actually happen to have a medical biologist who not only is a woman, she also identifies as one, and she gave us her opinion on that. So we delve down into not just the creation, not just the theology, but also you could say the humanities side of things, the social issues of today, um, as well as things like biblical archaeology, and we'll tell you a little bit about biblical archaeology as we go along. And one of the things that we've started most recently, literally in the last couple of weeks, is a live 24-7 broadcast which goes out around the clock. So uh, we've got churches all around the world who put it out live in their foyer, or if you've got a, a Christian bookshop or a cafe or something, or if you just want it playing in the background, it's 24-7 content uh, all to do with creation research, evidence-based, Bible teaching, all sorts of things like that. Um, this has been our biggest project since the last time I was here, the museums project. Uh, it was just starting to uh, become a reality four years ago. COVID put a little bit of a, a slowdown to that, but it's really picked up in the last few years. Um, the Museums Project in the UK is a network of museums. We have our main museum in Oswestry, which is uh, right on the border of England and Wales down in Shropshire. It's about two and a half hours from here uh, down south. But we do have over 30,000 fossils and artifacts in our museum collection. We've been incredibly blessed over the years, not just by being able to go out and actually dig the things up, um, but also being able to acquire some really world-class artifacts. So in the museum, there it is in Oswestry. Um, oh, that's the, uh, that's the mock-up that one of our artists did. That's how it currently looks, so it's not quite as, 
as, as impressive yet. But once you get inside, things are really starting to come along. It's two stories. We're developing the museum upstairs so that you're able to be self-guided around it. At the moment, you can come and get a tour around the artifacts and the displays and uh, ask questions really delve down deep into some of the evidence. Not just the fossil evidence, but also the archaeological evidence. Yeah, we have some amazing artefacts on display, as well as your classic dinosaurs and your classic fossils like this one. It's a Jurassic fossil squid. Oh, let's break it down. Number one, this is supposed to be about 159 million years old. Now, if those dates are true, all you can prove from this fossil is that in 159 million years, squid have turned into squid. Because you all recognise that's a squid, because it looks like a squid. We call them living fossils. And that was actually a term coined by Charles Darwin, and he said it was one of the biggest problems with his theory, because his theory is based on a creature's ability to change. And yet, all you can see from these fossils is that the creatures don't change. Oh, Jurassic? has nothing to do with millions of years or evolution. It's simply named after the Jura Mountains in Germany. Because Alexander von Humboldt, who was the king's geographer, travelled the world and recognised that there were rocks that looked just like the ones back in the Jura Mountains. And it's true, you travel all over the world, the Jurassic rocks are all the same, they've got all the same fossils in them, it's a worldwide deposit for sure, and so he called them the Jurassic the rocks like the ones in the Jura Mountains. In fact, it gets a little bit worse than that because we've brought a few fossils along with us today. And what we have here are some fossil jellyfish. Can you see the big round things? These are fossil jellyfish. These are from Africa, North Africa, uh, and these are Ordovician. Again, nothing to do with millions of years, everything to do with where they were verse, first found. They were found in Wales, and the Ordovician is named after the Ordovici tribe the old Celtic tribe that used to live in Wales. Um, of course, Ordovician, 450 supposed million years, and yet they're still around today. 450 million years and no evolution in the slightest. So the reality is, when you go out on field trips, and I love taking people out to dig up fossils for themselves, one thing you quickly realise is that the rocks do not cry out the praises of Charles Darwin they cry out the praises of Jesus Christ. And that's really what we're going to be delving down into a little deeper today. But very quickly, just to give you a, a little sneak peek at some of the amazing things that you can see uh, in the museum collection, uh, let's just have a quick look at one of the more interesting artefacts that we've actually got. Here it is here. Um, oh, that was an Egyptian mummy mask, by the way, the one before. This is really exciting, though. You see the big brick that I'm holding? Can you see the sort of strange inscription that there is across the top? This is actually a Babylonian foundation brick. It was one of the main cornerstones that was used in an ancient Babylonian building. Now, there's a great story connected to this. It was collected by the Reverend Leonard Pearson back in the 1930s, back when it was perfectly legal to go to Iraq and pick up rocks and bring things back. Um, but it ended up basically going to the British Museum, where it went on display. And while it was in the British Museum, they did some translations. Oh, you can see the transcription on the top. Underneath the transcription, you have the transliteration, which is the Babylonian words put into English letters. And then there's the uh, official translation from the British Museum. Nebuchadnezzar. Ah, you recognise that name? King of Babylon, who provides for Eskilo and Isaida, the eldest son of Nabopolaza, King of Babylon, am I. Very quickly, number one, you recognise the name. This is a biblical figure. This is somebody from biblical history. But it gets even better than that because can you see that it's written in the first person? Nebuchadnezzar refers to himself as am I. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Now that's significant for two reasons. Number one, book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's prayer. It's written in the first person. And a while back... Critics of the Bible said there's no way that the book of Daniel could possibly have been written at the time that it was supposed to have been written because no scribe would dare write down the words, I am Nebuchadnezzar, because that would be considered blasphemy. The king was considered a god, just like I wouldn't write down, I am God. The scribes wouldn't write down, I am Nebuchadnezzar. So they said it must have been written hundreds of years after Nebuchadnezzar was alive. Then they started finding bricks like this. 
which do refer to the king in the first person. And they discovered one thing very quickly, the critics were technically correct. No scribe would write down the words, I am Nebuchadnezzar. So whenever you find the term Nebuchadnezzar written in the first person, like Nebuchadnezzar am I, or I am Nebuchadnezzar, it has always been written or stamped by the king himself. So, the two points. Number one, you can trust the Bible. It is an absolute accurate record of what was said because it was King Nebuchadnezzar who actually said it and wrote it down and declared it himself. Point number two, this Babylonian foundation brick um, was actually stamped by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Now, that's pretty exciting. And if you come to the Creation Museum in Oswald Street, you can actually see this for yourself. Or if you want really, really exciting biblical artefacts, you can't go too far wrong with a jar handle stamped with the royal seal of Hezekiah that we managed to get from the Israel Antiquities Authority. Amazing pieces of evidence from biblical archaeology for sure. Um, it's not just the biblical archaeology, it's also the fossils as well. Let's see if this is... Let's just move on from that. Whoops, there we go. Um, amazing fossils from all over the world. Fast fish fossils. Giant fossils all the way from Africa. Fossils like the deep sea creatures buried next to land plants, which you know one thing for sure, if you have deep sea creatures and land plants buried together, you are dealing with a flood. And the biggest thing that you learn when you come to our museums is that all things were made by Jesus Christ. I do hope you realise that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's explicitly clear that it's Jesus Christ who does the creating. Colossians 1.16, all things were made not only by Christ, they were made for Christ. It's in Jesus Christ that all things are held together. And of course, the famous opening verses of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by the Word that was God, and without him nothing was made that was made. Who is the Word? Skip down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, we really are dealing with something that is much bigger than just the world that we live in. We're really dealing with Jesus Christ. So uh, do check out the Creation Research Centre website. Support the Global Museum Ministry. We have six major museums in the works around the world. And the idea for the UK is to create a network of museums where churches or local groups of churches can actually host their own exhibition of fossils and evidence on display. So we have a constantly rotating arsenal of evidence going all around the world. And do sign up to the Creation Research newsletter, which you can do at the back, which will tell you where we'll actually uh, be and what we're doing and what field trips are going on. And you can also pray for the UK team as we continue to minister all over the world. All right, well, let's get into our main topic, this idea of rocks, this idea of fossils, and we're going to do a little bit of science, we're going to do a little bit of digging, and then really we want to try and bring it round to a biblical point, because this is a Sunday morning, and uh, really, what are we all doing here if it isn't for Jesus Christ? But let's start with the UK. Right down on the south coast of the UK, you have Dorset. Along the south of Dorset, you have the Jurassic Coast. Uh, there's another Jurassic coast up on the Yorkshire coast around Whitby as well. But the reason we went down here uh, is because last year we had our first ever fossil hunting convention. And by the way, we're hoping to run it again next year. We're hoping to run it in future years as well and move in different places around the country. What is our fossil hunting convention? Well, it was six days. Every day we'd go down on the beach. Every day we'd go and dig up fossils. And in the afternoon, we'd have workshops to look at what we'd found, to work out what the evidence is. And in the evening, we would have seminars. We had people like Answers in Genesis there who were giving lectures in the evenings. But every single day, we'd go down on the beach to dig up fossils. And here is Dr. Diane Eager, one of our medical biology researchers for Creation Research. And she's found a fossil. Can you see the great big long brown thing? Ah, you see, this long brown thing is actually some fossil timber. It's fossil wood. And it's so brilliantly preserved that we actually know what kind of tree this wood came from. It's from one of the oricaria trees or southern conifers. 
Um, southern conifers all grow natively to the southern hemisphere, most of them in tropical and subtropical environments. There is one southern conifer tree that can just about cope with our English climate, and that's the mountainous South American variety, which we call the monkey puzzle tree. Right? Some of you might be familiar with that. So this is basically fossil monkey puzzle tree, but look at what it's buried next to. Can you see the curly whirly ammonite? Ah. Curly whirly ammonites are deep sea creatures. Oricaria southern conifers are land plants. You see, if you get deep sea creatures and land plants buried together, you have evidence of a flood. Oh, and by the way, um, this is not a, 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 a rarity. This is not an anomaly. This is the norm. Because you can walk down the south coast and you can find entire forests buried in the rocks next to fish, next to dinosaurs that have been squashed. And we need to dig through some of this to try and get a bigger picture. Um, I hope you do come on a field trip one day. Whoops, we went too far. There we go. Uh, well, try again. There we are. hope you do come on a field trip one day uh, because it's a great time to get down and, I mean, if you like hitting things, you can't really go wrong because <laughs> you get big hammers and whack open rocks and see what you can find. But it's a great time to get down and delve deep into the evidence. Take, for instance, uh, Susie here, who's just found a fossil as well. Susie now works for us in the UK office, um, but she found this fossil. It's another living fossil. Uh, you remember the point of living fossils? Just like our Jurassic fossil squid, this is a Jurassic Nautilus. Nautiluses are still alive today. They're a shelled cephalopod, a shelled squid-like creature. And these rocks are supposed to be 199 million years old, almost 200 million years old. And yet these creatures are still alive today. And all you can prove is that if those dates are real, if they really are 200 million years old, all they've done for 200 million years is exactly what God told them to do when he created them, which is to reproduce after their own kind. You see, that's the real important factor when it comes to living fossils. It's the fact that if God says something once, you ought to pay attention. If God says something ten times in one chapter, he's really trying to drive a point home. And in ten times in Genesis chapter 1, the statement, after their kind, as in God creating creatures after their kind, or God commanding creatures to reproduce after their own kind, is stated ten times in Genesis chapter 1. So don't be surprised when you actually go and dig up the fossils, the evidence that we see is that creatures reproduce after their own kind. Um, this was one of the best finds. You see the giant fossil tree behind it? Again, it's a oricaria, it's a southern conifer, and it's amazing the kind of things that you can find. But again, these are Jurassic living fossils. 200 supposed million years. Oh, there's your standard geological column. Uh, you may be familiar with this if you've seen it in books or on, in the television or in textbooks or in school books. You see your standard geological column? And if you read the rocks as a history of the world, what you claim is that the rock layers at the bottom got there first. The rock layers at the top got there last. And therefore the rock layers at the bottom are the oldest, the rock layers on the top are the youngest, and you're looking at a history of the world over millions of years. Because look, there's where your Jurassic rocks are between 200 and 145 million years old, supposedly. Um, the big question is, is this model reliable? Because all of the millions of years is based on this model. And evolution itself is only plausible if the world really is millions of years old. Because Charles Darwin observed change. And we can observe change today. But what he observed was very small amounts of change. And his logic was simple. If we can observe small amounts of change over a small amount of time, surely over a large amount of time, we can see a large amount of change. Oh, that was his argument. And so he took the earlier work of people like Charles Lyell, who claimed that the Earth was millions of years old, and he simply said, well, if the rocks are a real history of the world over millions of years, then given enough time, evolution must have happened. Therefore, the rocks show a record of life on Earth over millions of years. But what about this model? Is this model, this geological column as it's called, is it actually reliable? 
Well, here's a quote from Professor Derek Ager. Professor Derek Ager was the um, professor of geology at Swansea University. He was not a Christian, nor was he a creationist, but he, he did point out some very significant problems with modern geological thinking and the way that we interpret the rocks. Look at what he said. Nowhere in the world is the record, that's the geological record, that geological column, nowhere in the world is the geological record, or even part of it, anywhere near complete. Even in the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River and the adjacent sections along the Little Colorado River, surely the finest record of geological history anywhere on Earth, there are huge breaks. And it really is true. If you go to the Grand Canyon, which is nearly a mile deep, and you go down and look at this beautiful record of what's supposed to be Earth's history over millions of years, 90% of the supposed time is missing. This geological column does not exist anywhere on the planet. So what we're going to do today is take a little bit of a step back and have a bit of a think through some of these geological processes. Some of the way that rocks work, and we're going to use real hands-on examples. So let's go to the Peak District. Uh, let's go to Harbour Hill near Buxton. Can you see all the white stuff? This is some of the original work that we did uh, in the UK. and We've been monitoring this deposit over the last 15 years now, uh, from when Creation Research first spotted it. There's where Creation Research first spotted it. You see our international director, John Mackay? He's the one who first came across this because uh, he was driving through the Peak District and he saw white stuff and he shouted, Stop! Limestone! And his um, friend in the car said, It's all limestone around here in the Peak District. It's all geologically limestone. But no, it was a rather specific deposit that he had spotted. Uh, you see the white stuff? Can you see how the white stuff is growing over the fences? The modern day fences, the stock fences. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I wonder how long would you say this deposit actually took to form? Well, you can actually work it out because um, these uh, fences were only manufactured, this fence post type and this, uh, this stock fencing type was only manufactured after World War II. So we're dealing with something that is 70 to 80 years at the most in terms of time to actually take over this fence. Oh, but it gets bigger than that because look, it's actually beginning to engulf the stone wall as well and actually take over all of the fence posts. And the fence posts are starting to become buried and what we realized as we dug down into the fence posts is the fence posts themselves are becoming fossilized because the petrification process is a process. It's a process by which minerals impregnate the wood and actually turn into solid rock. And it's happening live action. You can come on a field trip and can actually see it. Well, let's get a, a bigger picture of the processes going on here. There's the Google Maps image. Can you see the white deposit over to the right-hand side? Um, okay, you see the big industrial park? You see, we can go and speak to eyewitnesses because this deposit wasn't there that long ago. It's only been growing for the last 30 to 40 years because there are people there who live there and they say there wasn't any of this deposit until the industrial site moved in. Because then what happened is they built a waste chemical plant, right, you know, to clear out all the sewage and everything. And what that did is that put a load of bacteria into the surrounding environment because they use microbes and bacteria to help break down the waste. And what that did is it started to produce this large white deposit of limestone. Uh, I wonder what's going on here. You see, there's a geological process at play. Um, this is a pretty big deposit, by the way. It's literally filling up the valley. And when we first went to see there, it was just starting to take over the fence posts. By the time I went there a couple of years ago, um, it had nearly filled the valley and was running down the stream and was starting to take over houses down the road. And look at what's happening inside the deposit. We're starting to get fossils as the fossils begin to crystallise, as the leaves begin to get covered and impregnated with minerals. And we keep testing all up and down. You can do um, chemical tests, you can do pH tests. This is definitely limestone without a shadow of doubt. And look at all the layers. We are watching 
rock formations happening in real time, where they're beginning to actually fossilise leaves until they're completely and totally fossils. Now, this gives a really important point, because when you see fossils like this, you know one thing's for sure, it's got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with a process. But what process are we really dealing with? Because one of the things we've discovered over the years is that organic biomolecules, things like you know, bacteria and microbes, really can act as a catalyst in speeding up the process of making limestone. But if you open your books, your textbooks, if you look at how limestone is supposed to form, well, it's supposed to form very slowly over millions of years. Case in point, let's go to <coughs> Hunstanton, um, which is, uh, well, there we are again, there's the UK, there's Norfolk where I grew up, uh, and Hunstanton is right on the tip, and I grew up digging up fossils all throughout Nor um, Norfolk and, and at Hunstanton. And it's got some really rather beautiful rock layers at Hunstanton. Oh, can you see the uh, brown layer at the bottom? Then the red layer at the middle and the white layer at the top? You see, Hunstanton is really unique in terms of the rock layers that you can find there. Well, what are they called? At the bottom you have a sandstone. The sandstone is called carstone. Then you have a layer of red chalk. The red chalk is called the Hunstanton Formation. And at the top is the Ferriby chalk, which is basically your basic white chalk that you find. Now, what are we dealing with when we're dealing with dates? Well, these are the Cretaceous. Cretaceous literally means the chalk rocks. Um, there's the chalk. Well, there's a, some dates for you. The carstone is supposed to be 109 million years old. The red chalk is supposed to be 101 million years old. And the Ferriby chalk, the white chalk, is supposed to be 99 million years old. Now, I don't agree with these dates, but we need to understand what these dates are supposed to be so we can do some testing. You see, the Bible says in the uh, book of Thessalonians to test all things and only hold fast to that which is good. So we need to be doing some testing. So we do. I've been collecting from Hunstanton for years. I've been taking field trips there. And it's just stunningly beautiful. And some on these field trips, you can find some amazing fossils. You see the giant snail shells that uh, this young lady has found? It's amazing what you can discover at places like Hunstanton. Giant trackways as well. Um, that was one of our most exciting finds uh, that this lady found last time we were there, a giant arthropod trackway. And this is one of the previous ones that we found. You see the big ammonite in the middle? It's a big ammonite, but then on the ammonite is a shark's tooth. And then to the side of the ammonite is a sea urchin, a fossil one, that's actually turned up so that it's sitting vertically. In fact, there's the uh, modern sea urchin on the top, there's the fossil one on the side. Can you see how the rock layers cut across it? This is what we call polystrate. It's where a fossil runs up through many layers. And it tells you one thing's for sure, this creature didn't live, die and get buried, this creature was swept into position because it's not in its living state. It's been turned upside down. Um, oh, and it's a living fossil, by the way. Remember what the Ferriby chalk formation, the age was supposed to be? Nearly 100 million years old, and yet it hasn't changed. Not one change in the slightest. And then you find things like these brachiopods. Brachiopods are interesting. They're living fossils. They're still alive today. Uh, you can see the size of them. They're about five centimetres or two inches. Uh, can you see the little uh, hole in the top? You see, that's where a, a foot would attach because there's the living ones today and you can see how that foot is attached to the seabed and they kind of sit upright uh, with their sort of two halves so that they can open and close and filter feed. Well, let me show you how we find almost every single brachiopod fossil, seashell fossil, in the Hunstanton formation. Um, there it is there. It's upside down. It's not sitting the right way up. And it tells you that this creature didn't live, die, and get buried. This creature has been turned. It's been transported. It's been moved into position. So even just by the fossils, you can tell that this isn't just a shallow marine environment which is slowly building up over millions of years. Well, let's go back to the dates. 
99 million years at the top, 109 million years at the bottom. And now we're going to do some maths. Didn't know what you were getting yourselves in for on a Sunday morning to get yourself to do some, <laughs> to do some maths. But uh, this should be simple enough just to sort of understand where we're going with this, all right? Let's see if we can follow along. 109 million years at the bottom. 99 million years at the top. That means that those rocks have a representation of 10 million years. Um, in other words, according to the dates, with 109 million years at the bottom and 99 million years at the top, it took 10 million years to lay down the cliffs at Hunstanton Beach. Are we all following so far? According to the dates, it took 10 million years to lay down the rocks there. All right, how tall is the formation? How thick is it? Well, you can go and measure it, or you can look it up on the British Geological Survey. It is 20 metres or 65 feet. Now, that's an observable piece of data. You can go and measure it yourself. So, in other words, according to the dates, it took 10 million years to lay down 20 metres of sediment. Are we all following so far, yes? Excellent. Well, let's go one step further. Let's throw, we've done addition, let's throw uh, division into the equation. Because what we're going to do, we're going to take 20,000 millimetres. 20,000 millimetres is another way of saying 20 metres. All right? So we're going to take 20,000 millimetres and we're going to divide it by 10 million, which is how long it supposedly took in years to lay down the deposit. And what we're doing is we're working out the rate of formation. We're working out, according to the dates, how much sediment was being laid down every single year, according to the dates. The answer, 0.002 millimetres per year. Can you put your fingers that close together? It's a ridiculously small amount. Or that's 0. what is that? 0. 0. 0.007 inches per year. You do realise that there's a real big problem if you're actually going to take these dates as real history. Because, as it was pointed out by also by Professor Derek Ager, if you calculate the rates of formation based on the dates, the results are usually ludicrous. Um, that was his own, his own comment. And it really is true, 0.002 millimetres per year. You do have to realise that in order to get a deposit, you have to have a rate of formation which is faster than your rate of erosion. And your rate of erosion is a lot faster than 0.002 millimetres per year. Or if you really want to ramp it up, it comes to realise that it would have taken 14,285 years just to bury, uh, well, that's per inch, or that's what, 28,000 years to bury the brachiopod. 28,000 years to bury that seashell. Question, if you took 28,000 years to bury that seashell, would there be much seashell at the end of it? There wouldn't be any seashell at the end of it. Do you see how ridiculous the dates get very quickly? And the point is simple. It's got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with a process. Now, we do have to go one step further, because I've been using this argument. This was the, um, the main uh, subject of my um, first uh, dissertation for my first degree. And uh, one of the critiques that came out as a result of that was, well, of course, deposition wouldn't be constant when forming. You'd have fast flurries of sedimentation, and then it'd go quiet for several years, and then fast flurries of sedimentation. Well, the solution to that is, what does the evidence actually tell us about how this formation was actually deposited? Well, at Hunstanton, you find evidence like fossils buried rapidly. They're found all throughout the deposit, but what about evidence of currents and flow? You see, if this is a shallow marine environment where it slowly settles and builds up over millions of years, it should be a nice, gentle, steady deposit. You shouldn't have evidence, for instance, of flowing water going through it, washing these creatures into position. Well, the end result of this crit criticism is that there was a three-month research project which we did into Hans Stanton. It formed the basis of, like I say, my dissertation, which is a published piece of work in the secular literature, and we looked for evidence of transportation. That's evidence of these creatures having been washed into position by flowing water. In other words, we were looking for evidence of a flood. What did we find? 
we found that 93% of fossils showed evidence of transportation. In other words, all of these fossils were formed in flowing water, having been caught up in a slurry of sediment and being buried very quickly and fossilised very quickly with water flowing in one direction at the same time. This isn't a slow, gradual deposition over millions of years. This is a one-time event of flowing water. And you find evidence like all of the elongated squid fossils all pointing the same way. It's evidence of flowing water. It's evidence of transportation. It's evidence that rock formation and fossilisation has got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with a process. And just to give you a few quick quotes, again from Professor Derek Ager, he said this, we're always faced with a contradiction between the rates of deposition and the known thickness of a rock for a particular geological time. There really shouldn't be this amount of sedimentation because if the sedimentation rate is 0.002 millimetres per year, it should have all been eroded away. And there's that quote I mentioned earlier. If one attempts to calculate rates of sedimentation in the past, the results are usually ludicrous. Um, and it really is true. Calculate the rock layers up and you get to ridiculous results very, very quickly. Um, let's move on to another piece of evidence from the UK. Again, we're going down to the south coast. We're going back to uh, Lyme Regis area. And uh, again, the kind of things you can find there. Great big fossil trees buried next to those curly whirly ammonites. Deep sea creatures and land plants equal what? A flood. Because let's face it, what actually is a flood? Well, if you have a flood in your kitchen, where does the water belong? The water belongs in the sink. If you have a flood in the kitchen, where is the water? It's on the floor. So water is water where water shouldn't, or a flood rather, is water where water shouldn't be. You're looking for evidence of water where water shouldn't be. If you find fish buried next to trees, you have evidence that water has brought those two things together because water belongs in the oceans with the fish and not with the trees. If you find the two of the things mixed together, you know that water has come up onto the land, it's eroded sediment, it's washed these creatures together in a slurry of sediment and buried them together very quickly. That's the kind of evidence, by the way, you see with these giant fossil trees because they're buried upright, vertical, right next to giant fish, right next to the great ammonites and many other things. Um, here's another example from the Jurassic rocks at Lyme Regis. You see the big bits of fossil wood, the elongated things? You see all of the curly-whirly ammonites? They're all buried together, smashed together, a flood for sure. Living fossils like the Nautilus give us evidence that not only was this a flood, but there's been no evolution at all in the last 200 million years. In fact, even ammonites, which aren't living fossils, still don't show any evidence of evolution. Because again, if you read the geological record as a history of time on Earth, um, then ammonites first supposedly appeared from nowhere. They don't evolve from anything, but they appear in the Devonian rocks. They go extinct in the Cretaceous rocks, which means that for 290 million years, ammonites didn't change. They didn't evolve from anything. They didn't evolve into anything. They just remained exactly the same. So even the fossils which aren't living fossils aren't any help to evolution either. Um, well, also down on the Jurassic coast, you find things like dinosaurs. Yeah, land dinosaurs buried next to land trees, buried next to seashells. Ah, again, we're going back to that flood concept. Well, here's Skeletosaurus. Um, there's the artist's impression of Skeletosaurus, this land creature. There's what the actual fossil looked like. Um, that's a squashed dinosaur. You see the head thrown up, the legs squashed underneath. Well, you see, this is on display in the Charmouth Heritage Centre, and they don't like you taking pictures in there. So we had to go and find the original discoverer of Skeletosaurus and ask his permission if we could go and take some photos, because there were some rather fascinating things. Um, there is the owner's hand, by the way, pointing something out about this fossil. He's pointing at the throat of this animal. Why? Well, it's got fossil vomit there. 
And you can tell whether uh, food is on its way down or whether it's on its way back up based on how digested it is. And this is very digested food. And we know it's digested food because not only is there vomit in his throat, there's also vomit in his stomach or digested food in his stomach. You see, this is a creature that has been caught up so suddenly and rapidly and violently and squashed to the point that it's forced its stomach contents up and out of its mouth. This is a dinosaur which has food and vomit in its throat. It's been squashed and it's buried with seashells. You see, all the evidence suggests, particularly the fact that it's buried with seashells and it's buried in a water-based deposit, shows you that this creature drowned. Oh, and remember, these are the Jurassic rocks. So what are the Jurassic rocks named after? The Jura Mountains in Germany. But we're not in Germany, we're in England. And you can find the Jurassic rocks in the States. You can find them all throughout Europe, all throughout Asia. They turn up in Australia as well, because we have our Australian Museum, Jurassic Ark. And um, this is a worldwide deposit that we're dealing with. You could almost call it a worldwide flood deposit. It's funny, that. But the point is simple. If you have land creatures and seashells and plants all buried together, you're looking at evidence of a flood. And yes, you're looking at evidence that the flood once went all around the world. You're looking at evidence of a worldwide flood, just like the one described in the book of Genesis. Well, let's start to uh, round this rocks cry out and really just sort of hone it in on the importance of all of this when it comes to things like who is Jesus Christ? Let's take you to another field trip. This time we're still in the Peak District in Derbyshire. We're near Harper Hill and uh, we, again, we love to take people out and dig up fossils. It's amazing what you can find um, because today we're in Castleton in the UK. There's Mam Tor in the background, the famous mountain there down near the Blue John Mines. Um, What are we digging up there? Fossils. Oh, you see all the black rock? over there on the left hand side. This is black rock because it is full of carbon. It's where all the coal is. So don't be surprised that the rocks are called Carboniferous. Nothing to do with millions of years of evolution, everything to do with what the rock type is actually made of. Of course, if you are in the United States and you're American, uh, you wouldn't possibly go with the English naming. So you take the Carboniferous, you split it in two, and you call it the Pennsylvanian and the Mississippian. Again, nothing to do with millions of years of evolution, and no prizes for guessing what that was named after. But look at some of the fossils that we find in the Carboniferous. I mean, it doesn't look that impressive, does it? Well, you see, because this is a carbon, as you split the rocks open when they're very fresh, you have to allow a couple of minutes for the fossil to oxidise and really show its face. Um, Let's see if we can uh, give it a couple of minutes and see if it begins to show up what it is. I mean, I've pointed out the two significant things there. Let's see if we uh, allow it to oxidise a bit more. Can you start to see what it is now? Ah, Let's uh, let it get a little bit further along. Now it's really starting to show up. Can you see what it is? Let's put it under a special light in order to show. Can you see the thorns? These are fossil thorns. It's a fossil branch which has got thorns sticking out of it. Interesting. You see, according to secular evolution, the rocks here at um, Castleton, the Carboniferous rocks, are supposed to be 304 million years old. The Carboniferous rocks in general are around the 300 million year old mark, supposedly. In fact, if you go to Northumberland, there we are, can you see the big polystrate tree? The tree which is cutting up through many, many layers? Oh, that's a problem if you want to interpret 0.002 millimetres per year as well. But we're not here to talk about polystrate trees. We're here to talk about the fact that the Carboniferous here, because yes, this is full of coal, is supposed to be about 318 million years old. And yet, look what we're finding inside of it. Can you see the fossil thorns? Ah, there it is there. A nice set of fossil thorns. You see, are these rocks really... 318 million years old, according to the Bible. Well, this is where the real crux point comes, because according to the scriptures, they're not 318 million years old. And you say, how on earth do I know that? Well, there it is, Genesis chapter 3. 
Then God said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, the ground is cursed for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. You see, the Bible is not just a history of salvation. It's not just a history of beginning to end. It's a history of thorns. You see, in the beginning, God created the world, and the world was what? Very good. Then, very good, you and I tend to view today as a moral word, and it is. But it's so much more than that, because God described what this very good world was like. He said, in the beginning, when everything was very good, the animals only ate plants. He said, in the beginning, when everything was very good, Adam and Eve were naked, and they didn't get sunburn in the day, and they didn't freeze to death at night. So the climate was very good. And in the beginning, in the very good world, there were no thorns and there were no thistles. You see, the Bible is explicit that thorns and thistles are the result of man's sin. As a result, thorns and thistles did not come about onto the planet until after man was on the planet, until after man sinned, which actually means these rocks are less than 10,000 years old according to the Bible. Oh, where do we get that figure from? Well, if you take the genealogies that you find in Genesis all the way through the scriptures and you count them up, you get to an age of about six to 7,000 years old, depending on which Bible version you use. Um, if you want to argue there are gaps in the genealogies, which I don't believe there are, and that's a question for the question and answer time, uh, but if you do believe there are gaps in the genealogies, the oldest you can stretch the reading of Earth's history to is around 10,000 years. Any more than that, and you're no longer longer taking the Bible at face value and when it calls history, history. Um, you see, if thorns and thistles are found in the fossil record, it means that those rocks, according to the scriptures, were not around until after man was on the planet, which makes them less than 10,000 years old. Oh, and it's not just Northumberland. Let's go around the world. Let's go to Canada. Look at those thorns. These are some of the original fossil forms that we found in Nova Scotia in Canada. Um, these are the Carboniferous as well. There's the fossil, there's the modern day plant. There's no doubt that we're dealing with fossil thorns here. There's the coal layer where they come out of. Yes, again, we're dealing with the Carboniferous and it's supposed to be around 300 million years old. So ask yourself the question, when did this rock containing fossil thorns formed? According to scripture, it must have been after Adam sinned. Therefore, the Carboniferous Nova Scotia in Canada is not 300 million years old, but around six to 7,000 years old. What's the big deal out of all of this? What's the real point? Well, the point is simple. The world has changed. God has not. You do realize that going from uh, no thorns to thorns is change? And that's what evolution is supposed to be, right? But you know what? There are three main types of thorns. You have thorns, true thorns, you have prickles, and you have spines. And in all three of these pieces of uh, sharp, spiky things that stick out on plant, regardless of what we call them, they are all the result of degeneration. They're all the result of devolution. They're all the result of a loss of information. Because in the case of the true thorns, it's where the plant has failed to grow a branch. And so it becomes hard and spiky. In the case of prickles like the roses, it's a cancer which grows on the plant. And in the case of the spines like the cactus, it's where the plant has had a mutation which has caused it to shrink. So that the veins of the plant which transport water now stick out of the side. You see, the world has changed. It's gone from good to bad. But it hasn't evolved, it's devolved, it's going downhill. The world has changed from good to bad to worse. The world has changed, but God has not. Because Christ the Creator made a good world without thorns. Christ the Judge cursed the world with thorns. But what's the significance of thorns? Because thorns aren't just mentioned in Genesis. Where else are they mentioned? A crown of thorns. You see, Christ the Saviour died with the very representation of the curse that he was dying to take away because we have a promise that Christ the King will rule over a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more thorns. How do we know? Revelation 22, there shall be no more curse. You realise that this 
statement in Revelation only makes any sense in light of Genesis being literally and historically true. Because God made a good world. The world was cursed because of man's sin. Christ died to take away that curse, to take away the curse of sin, to take away the curse of death. And it says that death will be thrown into the lake of fire and in the new heavens and the new earth there shall be no more curse. My challenge to you, take off Darwin's glasses and start seeing things God's way. And we're going to finish with a Bible verse that we shall start this evening's presentation with. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ. No matter what challenges we face, no matter what questions we have, whether it's about fossils, whether it's about thorns, or whether it's about the topic of race and racism, which is what we're going to be dealing with tonight, this is where we need to start. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. If we start by seeing the world God's way, things become a lot clearer much, much quicker. Well, thank you.